Uh, so we're going to look this evening at uh, number four on this series, Great Ways to Kill Our Church. I think we're going to look at maybe one more, and then we'll conclude, so maybe a week or more. Here's a little a way of review. Great way to kill our church, number one, we said, was allow God's house to deteriorate. And uh, that going from the building, but also many other things within God's house. We ought to put emphasis on God's house, not allow it to fall apart. Uh, allow the past to be the hero, always starting every spiritual conversation with, remember when, oh, wasn't it so great years ago? And uh, no, it's so great right now. Uh, I have a friend in particular, anytime we talk together, he's a little bit older than me, anytime we talk, all he talks about is high school. And it seems like high school was his best days. And high school wasn't bad for me, but I certainly have had much better days since high school. And uh, if the, the best part of your life was high school, uh, you're not doing something right in life, all right? Uh, you can do whatever you want now. You're not in your parents' house. Uh, you have your own money. Uh, I say that you know, tongue in cheek, but, but for real. Like, <laughs> uh, life, boy, the best I, I feel like, and of course the Lord has been so good to me, but it feels as though every year is a little bit better. And uh, as of course that has to do with uh, a lot of the blessings that the Lord has given to my life, but I believe also because the Lord has really pushed me to continue to grow closer to Him. And as we grow, grow closer to Him, those years ought to be getting better. So allowing the past to be the hero, allow the great commission to become the great omission. That is a great way to put the nail in the coffin of a church is to really do everything but the most important thing, the whole reason why we're here, right? Uh, if, if after we got saved, that was the end of our Christian life, we would get vacuumed into heaven. But we didn't. Why? Because we are supposed to let our light shine before men. And uh, many of us are doing, uh, most of us are doing a great job at that. And, and more and more and more, we're just seeing divine appointments. And you think, that's so crazy. How did, how did God order that circumstance? Well, God can trust you with your light. And he's bringing people un under the beam of that light. Now, we're going to look at one more this evening. A great way to kill our church is to stop praying together. Stop praying together. Let's um, turn, or I'll flip the page here, to Acts chapter 1. Prayer is another one of those aspects of the church that seems so, it seems so elementary, right? It's like, why would we even have to preach a message on prayer? Brother Kurt, I just, rem or no, you're dealing with a kid. Who isn't dealing with a kid? You no, you're going to be able to find it. In my office, underneath my black stackable, I have a, a list. I think it's on the top, on, but it's underneath called the names of, uh, on the list of the names of God. I just realized I left for my message. Prayer is one of those aspects of, of the church where it's like, why, why would we have to preach a message on that? It's so simple. It's like, read your Bible, pray and you'll grow, right? But yet, we, so often, I, I get paid to study God's word and pray, and I still don't pray the way that I ought. Why? Because it is a, such a foundational, to the, it's so foundational to the success of church, and the Satan will do anything to keep you from praying. So, many, many people, many Christians, many churches lose their zeal for prayer, and Really, we see as we read in Acts chapter 1, which would be kind of the beginning of the New Testament church, prayer was a foundational aspect of the church. When he had spoken, this is Jesus, these things, while they beheld, who were they? This was the 11 disciples. He was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. Interesting little side note. When the disciples were reminded that Jesus was coming back, they immediately went to where they were supposed to be and started doing what they were supposed to do. One of the encouragements to us that helps us do what we ought to do. We, we ought to be where we're supposed to be doing what we're supposed to do just simply because we love God and he loves us, right? But another encouragement is that 
God is coming back, right? Jesus is coming back. Just like uh, we were often reminded, your, your father is coming home. And that would always be an, an extra incentive to do whatever we were supposed to do, wherever it was supposed to be done. Jesus is coming back when the disciples were reminded that Jesus was coming back. They went to where they were supposed to be, did what they were supposed to be doing, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. Here's a... Here's the key. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So what do we learn from that? Um, Let me see. Is there another verse? So takeaways from the early church. First of all, we see that they prayed together. There is time for private prayer. And there is also time for corporate prayer. And Really, we should, we should never only pray alone, but we also should never only pray when we're at church, right? And I feel like sometimes we have people that are on both sides of the spectrum. Some people, they, they refuse to pray together in a corporate setting for whatever reason. Maybe, and I don't know if this is the case, but maybe um, they don't come to Wednesday night Bible study just simply because they're afraid to pray with somebody. Like, well, if I get paired, I would have to pray. And they're just afraid or embarrassed about that. I don't know why that would be a thing, but that's a thing. But so there's some folks, they only will pray privately, but then there's some folks, they don't ever pray at all, except when they come to church. And those are the folks where, you know, they're going to try to make the most just lovely, flowery, our gracious God and glorious heavenly father. There's nothing wrong with calling God a a wonderful name because he has a wonderful name, but Sometimes it, it comes across as kind of disingenuous, right? And so we, we ought to be somewhere in the middle. We ought always never, we shouldn't just pray alone. We also should be willing to pray more than just corporately. They also prayed steadfastly. That word steadfast means intensely or earnestly. Intensely or earnestly. Picture this. Okay, here's, here's the setting. They were, there was the 11. They watched Jesus go up. Then... Um, Two angels came and said, hey, fellas, what are we doing? Go and do what he just told you to do. And then they went, and very shortly thereafter, they're found praying. I wrote this. They prayed like they believed in Jesus. They prayed like they believed in Jesus. They had just watched Jesus, the living word, for three and a half years in earthly ministry. They had watched him be crucified. They saw his wounds. And then he ascended into heaven. I wonder what their prayer was like. Do you think that they prayed boldly? Do you think that when they believed that their prayer was going to be heard and answered? Absolutely. The Jesus the disciples walked with and saw ascend into heaven and prayed to, as best as I can find in the Word of God, he hasn't changed. He's the same God. He's just as real. He's just as powerful. But yet... Oftentimes, I think we, maybe we don't have as much belief as the disciples did. And we ought to pray like we believe in Jesus. I believe that if we were to look at, if you were to go back into your mind to any point in time of the good old days of the church or the good old days of your Christian walk with God, you say, boy, this time was when this and such church that I was a part of, boy, they were on fire. They're not so much anymore, but boy, back then they were. Or the same thing with your Christian life. Boy, I was, this and such time, I was closer to God than anything. I think the good old days of most churches or Christian walks would coincide with the best days of your prayer life or the best days of that church's prayer life. Prayer was the lifeblood of the early church. Jesus taught his disciples to be completely dependent upon him for daily provision, right? What did he say when he called the disciples? Follow me. They followed him. They said, Master, where we're going? Just follow me. Master, what are we going to do? Follow me. So he, he finally got them to start to completely depend upon him for daily guidance and provision. And then he left. It's almost like he was playing a cruel trick on them. 
they were still daily dependent on Jesus. And I think this is what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples. He got them to the point where they had to have Jesus. They had to be with Jesus. They had to hear him speak. They needed him to tell them where they were going, what to do. Daily dependent on him. Now they leave. How, much, how strong do you think their prayer life was? Very strong. They were still daily dependent upon him, but yet he wasn't there. But he said, I, I've given you a way to talk to me. So their prayer was strong. Here's what happens. In the 21st century, we don't rely on prayer as much because we have developed methods and worldly solutions and wisdom of men to replace our dependence on God. That's a difficult thing to read because that's me, right? I don't maybe depend on God as much as the disciples did because I draw a paycheck from the church. The disciples didn't. I don't depend upon God as much because I have a written textus receptus. They did not have the Word of God. In fact, they were going to be writing the Word of God. Uh, okay, So it's just a totally different time, and they were completely dependent upon God. But we become dependent on a number in a bank account, a method, a church, where we lean on each other, when really we ought to be leaning on the Lord. I want to read an excerpt from a book. And this man, he went, from, went to different churches when they were starting to show signs of decay and, and possibly even... I missed a slide. There we go. Um, I, this man would go to different churches that were struggling and, and showed signs of maybe they were going to close down, and he would attend a few services, he would just observe, and then he would meet with the, um, the leaders of the church and say, here's some, here's some of the things I think that are lacking in the church. Here's some ways I think that you can, can turn this thing around. He is sharing a, 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 a chapter of where the churches quit praying together. And this is a testimony from a lady named Dorothy. He was, he was asking her, this church had completely closed down, uh, was no longer existent. And he was, he was interviewing these folks afterwards, asking them, why do you think your church died? And he asked her about if the church had a prayer time. This was her response. Dorothy spoke next. Oh, yes, she said, we prayed together as a church. We had a Wednesday night meal and prayer time. When we were larger, we were able to afford cooks to prepare our meals. But as we lost members, we had to go to potluck. That was a shame. Because, you know, you never knew what the other people were going to bring. I remember one night we had 12 vegetables and one dessert. No meat, no bread. Boy, that was a shame. She had gotten off topic, so I guided her back. Tell me about the prayer time on Wednesday nights, I asked. Well, she said... Carl would pass out a prayer list to all of us. I interrupted her since I didn't know Carl. She, she continued, well, Carl, he was a deacon that had a copy machine in his office. We used to have a church secretary to type that list, but we had to let her go because we couldn't afford her. Carl just kind of picked up the slack in that area. You know, it was a sad day when we could no longer have a full-time secretary. Boy, that was a shame. Again, I guided her back to the topic of prayer. Well, that's pretty much it, she said. Carl would pass out the prayer list and one person would have the blessing and pray for those on the list. Then we would eat. Of course, there was that one time when we had no bread and no meat. That was a shame. <laughs> you get the picture pretty quick where, the, where it went awry. There was way more emphasis on the meal before the prayer time and the execution of the prayer time than it was about the prayer time. And if we're not careful, we get there, right? Because we become so consumed with how it's done and what's done. And ultimately, who cares if there was a meal? Who cares if Carl didn't have the bulletin or not? Prayer was the main thing, and that's what was missed. So, Lord, teach me to pray. Here's where we're going to spend a little bit of time. How do I know how to pray effectively? We don't have to argue a whole lot on a Sunday night crowd to understand that prayer is important and that if prayer begins to not become important, that the church is going to suffer. I have to say, I am so thankful that our church 
is filled with prayer warriors. I am thankful that there are many people will, will, will share with me, or they'll text me throughout the week praying for you. I hear testimonies. Of, I heard a testimony a couple weeks ago from someone I really didn't even know that said, boy, we, we think about you, we pray for your church and, 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 and you and your family often. Pray, praise the Lord for that. There's a, a, a man who came who goes to the different um, <clears throat> county fairs and, and uh, reaches people through the, that, that three door, three things that God can't do, Brother Gardner. And uh, he sent me at the, at the beginning of this year, he sent me a card and at the top of it was my name and then it had all 12 months and every month, every single a uh, day of the month was written out, and then he had circled every single day. He had come in August. From the day that he came, he had prayed for me every single day except one day. And that was just a prayer reminder, and that's one of his strengths is prayer. And I'm so thankful for people who pray. That is one of the main reasons why God is working so powerfully and so evidently in our church. It's people who pray. People like Martha and Joe who come in, on a regular basis, they walk through the, the building and they pray. And, and that's it. That is so important. I'm thankful for that. So we know that prayer is important, but you say, well, prayer is not a strong suit. And be frank, very frank with you. I pray. I pray a lot. I pray often. But prayer is not one of my natural strengths. I am not a natural prayer. So how do we become a good prayer? Lord, teach me to pray. How can I pray without ceasing? How do I know I'm praying in God's will? How, what's the best way to learn to pray? The best way to learn to pray is to ask the Lord to teach us. The disciples did that. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. I would imagine that after listening to Jesus pray to the Father, that your prayer life would seem pretty inadequate. And so you would say, Lord, would you teach me to pray like that? And uh, John also, as John also taught his disciples, and he said unto them, when you pray, say, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So here we see a pretty, uh, a pretty straightforward prayer, an example prayer. Now, this prayer is often quoted. I chose this passage partly because it's a little bit different than what's generally quoted, just to, th just to throw you off. Uh, but uh, we see here an outline for prayer. The, m the moment that a prayer becomes a chant or a repetition, then maybe, again, we've, we've put more, put more uh, faith in the method than we have in the God of that we're praying to, right? So let's just look briefly. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on two of the aspects, but just kind of break it down. So how do we pray? First of all, is that it? Perfect. And now I'm lost. Sorry, Brother Mark. Um, how do we pray? We pray to God, our Heavenly Father. We, and we'll leave it at that, pray our Father, which art in heaven. Number two, we honor his name. Hallowed be thy name. I want to get back to that scripture. Right here. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed means to ceremonial, ceremonially consecrate or to mentally venerate. To, it is holy. It is, God's name is holy. When we pray, we should worship, exalt, meaning to lift up. We should adore and honor his name. When I was younger, I would hear of course, Dad often would preach on God's name and how we ought to honor it. And as a young person, you know, I just always thought, like, how long could you actually pray about God's name? And, and you know, there's a, a long list of, God's, of names of God. And you're just, but like, how, how, as I'm getting older, a lot of, I'm finding a lot of the songs that I listen to are songs that sing specifically about his name and list, met, and list many of his names and Worship his name. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 2. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. I'm going to read a list of the names of God that are listed in the Bible. And at the end, I think it'll be pretty clear and obvious. Not only is there 
a long list of names that we could praise God for, but all of God's names, all the different expressions of God in the Word of God help us to understand something a little bit different, but still consistent with who God is. And we, it causes us to pray. Names of God, Abba, Advocate, Almighty, All in All, Alpha, Amen, Ancient of Days, Anointed One, Apostle, Arm of the Lord, Author of Eternal Salvation, Author of Our Faith, Author of Peace, Author, author of Peace, Avenger, Beginning, Bishop of Souls, Blessed and Holy Ruler, Branch, Bread of God, Bread of Life, Breath of Life, Bridegroom, Bright Morning Star, Buckler, Captain of Salvation, Carpenter, Chief Shepherd, Chosen One, Christ, Christ of God, Christ the Lord, Christ, Son of the Living God, Comforter, Commander, Consolation of Israel, Consuming Fire, Cornerstone, Counselor, Creator, Crown of Beauty, Dayspring, Deliverer, Desired of All Nations, Diadem of Beauty, Door, Dwelling Place, Elect One, Emmanuel, End, Eternal God, Eternal Life, Eternal Spirit, Everlasting Father, Everlasting God, Excellent, Faithful and True, Faithful Witness, Father, Firstborn, Firstfruits, Fortress, Foundation, Fountain of Living Waters, Friend, Fuller Soap, Gentle Whisper, Gift of God, Glory of the Lord, God, God Almighty, God of the whole earth, God over all, God who sees me, Goodness, Good Shepherd, Governor, Great High Priest, Great Shepherd, Guide, Head of the Body, Head of the Church, Heir of all things, Hiding Place, Highest, High Priest, High Priest forever, Holy Ghost, Holy One, Holy One of Israel, Holy Spirit, Hope, Horn of Salvation, Husband, I Am, Image of God, Image of His Person, Emmanuel, Intercessor, Jah, Jealous, Jehovah, Jesus, Jesus Christ our Lord, Judge, Just One, Keeper, King, King Eternal, King of Glory, King of the Jews, King of Kings, King of Saints, Lamb of God, Last Adam, Lawgiver, Leader, Life, Light of the World, like an eagle, lily of the valleys, lion of the tribe of Judah, living God, living stone, living water, Lord, Lord God Almighty, Lord of hosts, Lord Jesus Christ, Lord of all, Lord of glory, Lord of hosts, or Lord of harvest, Lord of hosts, Lord of lords, Lord our righteousness, love, loving kindness, maker, majesty on high, man of sorrows, master, mediator, Merciful God, Messenger of the Covenant, Messiah, Mighty God, Mighty One, Most Upright, Nazarene, Offspring of David, Omega, Only Begotten Son, Our Passover Lamb, Our Peace, Physician, Portion, Potentate, Potter, Power of God, Prince of Life, Pr Life Prince of Peace, Prophet, Prophet of the Highest, Propitiation, Purifier, Quickening Spirit, Rabboni, Meaning Teacher, Radiance of God's glory, Redeemer, Refiner's fire, Refuge, Resurrection, Rewarder, Righteous One, Rock, Root of David, Rose of Sharon, Ruler of God's creation, Ruler over kings of earth, Ruler over Israel, Savior, Scepter, Seed, Servant, Shade, Shepherd of our souls, Shield, Shiloh, Song, Son of David, Son of God, Son of Man, Son of the Most High, Spirit, spirit of adoration, or spirit, excuse me, spirit of adoption, spirit of God, spirit of truth, star out of Jacob, strength, stone, stone of Israel, stronghold, strong tower, son of righteousness, teacher, temple, the one, true light, true witness, truth, vine, wall of fire, way, wisdom of God, witness, wonderful word of God, word, Yah. How could I pray for more than two minutes about the names of God? That's pretty powerful just reading the list. I read that a few times in my office, just kind of going over it and shh, powerful. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I think sometimes we've forgotten who God is. We think we, oh, it's God. But the way that we pray, 
and the way that we conduct ourselves doesn't, doesn't really show that we know in full who God is. How ought we to pray? Thy kingdom come. I believe that's a twofold request. First of all, we pray for the world now to be characterized by God's kingdom right now. And we also pray for God's kingdom to come, the promise of his kingdom, right? Well, what characterizes God's kingdom? What would I pray for today that the earth would look like God's kingdom? What characterizes God's kingdom is the love of God. Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. This was someone who asked, what's the greatest commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. So we pray that the love of God would go forward in the world. We pray that, this is something I've been praying, that God's love would be shown through me. It's hard to be judgmental or condemning when you look at yourself, kind of from a, take two steps back, look at yourself and your sin and who you are, and understand that God's grace was given to you, understand the long-suffering that God has, to, has towards you, the love that he shows to you. Understand that fully and then go out and be rude and hateful to somebody. Understand that fully and condemn somebody for the way that they look. Can't do it. And one thing I've been praying is that God's love would be shown through me. So we pray, thy kingdom come. We pray, first of all, that me and today would look like God's kingdom on earth, but also, of course, praying for the promise of the new heaven and new earth to be fulfilled. Revelation 21.1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Praise the Lord for that. And there was no more sea. And I, saw, and I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are all passed away. So we pray that, God's, that, the, that the earth would look like God's kingdom, the love of God, the unity of Christ would be here in our church, in my heart, in our world. And also pray that for the promise of God's new kingdom, thy will be done. We need to stop praying my will, start praying thy will. Thy will be done. Brother Mark gave a great testimony of a few weeks ago in Sunday school, we need to stop asking, what is God's will for my life? And just start asking, what is God's will? Because even when we say, what is God's will for my life? Who, whose life is it? It's not yours. It's God's. We need to not be selfish. Prayer is not a way to get God to accomplish your will here on earth. Prayer is a way to accomplish God's will. Here on earth. I, I said that wrong. Prayer is not a way for us to get our will done in heaven. Prayer is a way for God to get heaven's will done here on earth. And we pray, not my will, thy will be done. Jesus prayed that, right? When he was in the garden, he said, nevertheless, not as I will, thy will. John 5, John 5, verse 19, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. This verse is, really helps, I believe, shape the way that I pray. John 5, verse 19, Jesus said, I can do nothing, Jesus, but what I see the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Do you know what Jesus did when he was here on earth? He completely submitted to and was obedient to God's will. Say Jesus did a lot of amazing things on earth. Yeah. But he gave us the blueprint to have, what did Jesus say before he left? He said, and greater things you'll do. Why? How is that possible? If we completely submit to God and simply obey what he tells us when he speaks to us, we can do as great and greater things than Jesus did when he was here on earth. So we pray, God, would you show me where you're working 
God, would you help me to be willing to be a part of that? Let's keep moving. He prayed that they would be kept from evil. And we ought to pray that we are delivered from evil, not delivered from this world, not God change this world. God, keep me from this world. Keep me from doing what I ought not to do. Help my light shine. So that's just a little, of course, that is just an absolute elementary brief overview of prayer. We could preach for years on prayer, but we're not. But we know the importance of prayer. And we have the outline given to us by Jesus Christ on how to pray. Will we do it? A great way to kill our church is to not pray together. Pray individually. We ought to, the Bible talks about entering into our closet to pray. But then there are times where we need to pray together. That's why I love Wednesday nights. We come together. Sometimes we pair up in groups. Sometimes we pair up just uh, one-on-one and pray together. But ultimately, that is the most important aspect of our church, is praying and seeking God's faith together. I believe we'll have one more message uh, like this. We'll probably wrap up next week and we'll move on to some new things I'm excited uh, to preach about. But let's not forget the importance of prayer.